Hey, welcome back to the show. It's two for one tonight because uh, I've got a review of Excalibur number two and Marauders number two. That's two number twos. Will they be good or will they be more like uh, what, number two? Let's find out today on Comic Book News. Hey, welcome back to Comic Book News. Uh, I'm Dan Shaheen. You're in the uh, all-new, slightly upgraded uh, Krakoan Command Center. So uh, please, please pay close attention today as we're going to review uh, Excalibur uh, number two and Marauders number two. Two number twos, two for one. Why not? I mean, these books were good. Uh, they weren't great. I don't think each one deserved its own review. Um, nothing too spectacular goes on here. A little bit of clues here. Whoa. Uh, as far as the, 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 the dawn of X and, and what's going on with Professor X, but still not much teased. Uh, you know, I'm reminded a bit of this death of Professor X. It, is, it reminds me a lot of what's going on over in Batman right now with the death of Alfred who died like months ago and is only finally being addressed now. So they actually do talk about it a little bit and what the implications are in this issue. Um, but, you know, uh, why talk about it when we can uh, check it out in the Million Dollar Comics. <laughs> Million Dollar Comics Cam. We got two today. Why the heck not? Uh, let's start with uh, Excalibur number two. Um, this is written by Teeny Howard, art by Marcus Toe, and color art by Mahmoud Azrar. Uh, and uh, it looks pretty good. It opens up with some historical stuff that's not exactly clear. Apparently, fourth century uh, BC. Uh, Apocalypse had early mutant um, acolytes that died uh, in this bay. And uh, that's going to come into play a little later in the issue. Now here we are uh, with uh, Kitty Pride br bringing the uh, new Excalibur team to their lighthouse destination. And destiny awaits thee. Uh, the new nation of Krakoa offers the promise of peace to mutant kind. But peace has been hard to come by. Former villainous Apocalypse has declared his intention to harness mutant magic, but not everyone is convinced, especially since his experimentation seemed to put Rogue into a mysterious floral coma. And War in Otherworld called Brian Braddock into battle against the sorceress Morgan Le Fay, but when she possessed Brian, he used the last of his strength to give his twin sister Betsy the Amulet of Right, bestowing upon Betsy the mantle of Captain Britain. And, uh... That brings us to where we are today. We get our cast of characters, including Shogo, who I guess is a, a human baby that Jubilee has adopted. I, someone in the comments said she's that this kid's been around for a while. I don't really know the backstory on it, and frankly, I didn't research it. I will for next time. Um, issue number two of Excalibur. We get some cool stuff. I like that they're trying to bring in like more mythology of the British Isles, so things like Selkies, these sort of like wear seal people. Um, that are attacking them. Uh, so we get some nice action. The artwork is really nice uh, for the most part. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with the uh, with the Toes uh, artwork and the coloring is just fine. And we get to see, you know, more of the story here. Rogue is their sleeping beauty, complete with they got all kinds of puns uh, or, or they're talking, making all kinds of jokes about we should kiss her to wake her up. Um, and then here we get to see this sort of like uh, cult of druids that is on the island that is like more loyal to Captain Britain and is opposed to the cult that we saw in the first issue uh, that that works for the cult of Akaba and this that chick, uh, what's her name? Mariana Stern from last time who killed all her coven co-mates. Anyway, we get to see, it looked like the tower was gone, but here it rises out of the ground, taking Rogue to the top of it. We're getting fairy tale symbolic. Uh, and speaking of towers and fairy tale symbolism, here we go from the Grimoire of Apocalypse. This is Apocalypse's symbol. And uh, basically, this is just a clue sort of what's going on. I've translated this for you. This, time, this says gate. And focus one says nadir. 
N A D I R. Um, and and focus two says a pinnacle, which I'm I hate to be a stickler, but you know the opposite of nadir of nadir is not pinnacle. It would be zenith. Maybe that's a brand name, so they didn't want to use it. Anyway, what is this telling us? There's some kind of gateway here. Uh, uh, maybe uh, maybe it's attached to those two mutants. It says, take the two hailing from the 4th century BCE. In less than two millennia, the carbon has reformed into large crystal structures containing the power of the ages within. So I think this is something that we're going to get hip to later because as we'll see, uh, Apocalypse is very interested um, in this space. He says it was you know a mutant stronghold and he wants to protect it, but he obviously has other motivations. Then we get into a couple parts that I thought were pretty cool dream sequences. I'm a big fan of dream sequences in comics, and uh, this one has some neat ones. Sometimes they tell hints about what's to come or what the characters have been thinking. Anyway, Jubilee is like heavily worried about Apocalypse and her son. He showed a great interest. He showed some kind of interest in the son, Shogo, the human son. Next, we get to see uh, Captain Britain's dream, which is pretty cool. This she sees the sword. And she says this is a place she's never been before. She knows it. She wants to follow the message. She sees like the sort of tower of apocalypse. And she's who's she's getting served a plate says he will use us. We can use him. Is, she talk, is that talking about apocalypse? Maybe. It's a very evocative dream sequence. It looks nice. The uh, And I don't know. I like that stuff. Anyway, Shogo wakes her up. Uh, she goes to talk to the druids uh, and gets in a fight with the the cult right and meanwhile apocalypse is blah 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 and uh about uh sort of their history of the island and and uh and uh that uh you know how the, the cult had devoted themselves to apocalypse but they thought that they were like as good as mutants and Apocalypse was like, no, they should have known better. So basically they devoted their whole lives to them and he would just kill them. And they were sort of a break off now, splinter group. Anyway, Apocalypse says, all right, you got to get to Otherworld because you got to save Brian or he's going to be gone forever. So I'll just take care of the castle and oh, I can even take care of the baby if you want. No problem. Okay, so the team decides, no, we're not going to give you the baby, but you can stay with Rogue. Uh, uh, what's his face? Gambit is not too happy about this, but he's just kind of going along. Um, uh, they teleport. A apparently, you know, Captain Britain can go at will to other worlds, so she takes them to other world. The baby is missing though, suddenly out of Jubilee's hands. Where is she? Where's the baby? Where's my baby? Oh, and here's the a giant dragon saying Shogo. And is it me, or did Gambit change clothes into something more like medieval, or did he just put his hood on? It's hard to tell. So anyway, to be continued next time. Looks like some stuff with the baby and dragons. What dragons? Fairy tales? Okay, more of the same. We get a druid lullaby, which I read and did not get much out of. To be honest, I'm not even going to talk about it. But then uh, next, uh, slay the dragon. Okay. So now let's talk. Let's go straight into uh, Marauders number two, which. I don't know. I, I, I like these two about on par with each other. That's not to say I love them. Um, what I'm liking is the way that they tie in to Dawn of X, but it's not essential. If you just skipped reading these books, you wouldn't be missing anything, but you do get nice little additional layers, and I, that's, that's all we can ask for these days. So anyway, this book is really all about... It's not truly about the Marauders, which is the Kitty Pride team of mutants on the ship going around saving mutants and selling drugs. It's about the Hellfire Club and their wing, their branch of the sort of council of Krakoa, right? And uh, so they got a black king. The Hellfire Club's always had a black king and a white king, which I always sort of took to be like chess metaphors, right? But apparently there's a red one too. So what is it, black, white, and red? Is there also a green? Is this roulette? Does anybody care? Anyway, um, we get another piece that this is sort of like it looks like it's from a maybe from a reporter, and there's a there's a lot of stuff here talking about like what they're seeing and how 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 uh, Storm is able to like uh, hide their presence on the seas with clouds, and uh, that but 
uh, that there's two Omega level mutants on board. And I guess that's Ice Man and Storm. I believe is is also considered an Omega level mutant. Certainly not Pyro, who's getting played for comic relief in here. Anyway, Stepford Cuckoos. I didn't realize what all of them are back. All five of them are back, right? Because all bets are off as far as death in the mutant world. Um, and uh, here we get to see more, uh, uh, we get to see an extended conversation between Sebastian Shaw, the Black King, and um, uh, 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 the White Queen, Emma Frost. And uh, it, we cut back and forth between the action with the Marauders and, and White Frost. Now, for some reason, they're doing this thing with don't feed his powers too much like like they need lockheed to feed pyro's powers but he's got these flamethrowers uh, whatever anyway we get a fun little battle with one of my all-time favorite villains batrock who pretty soundly is like he's kicking some ass you know omega level mutant or not we're dealing with the master of savat batrock who's gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with captain america and uh you know so he puts up a decent fight we get more of like kitty pride's super tough fighter she's apparently not has martial arts it's not just that you can't touch her it's just she's a badass too but it ends up being a combination she uses her phasing powers in combination with some martial arts moves and it's pretty cool they did a neat thing in the last issue with it and and it's kind of cool too it's a a, a more o offensive spin on what has primarily always been a defensive power phasing like it's always like get away from things and go through things but She's using it a little more violently here, which we like. Um, we got more. We got Storm versus Batrock. In the end, you know, is Batrock going to be able to beat them? No. He proposes a deal. He's like, look, I was hired by, basically by Sebastian Shaw, to take these drugs that were supposed to go to a war-torn African nation, and I'm going to go sell it to a rich country club in the United States, is what it said. So Sebastian Shaw is trying to skim a little cream off the top of the Hellfire Club, and uh, the White Queen wanted nothing to do with it, and and has sent basically sent Kitty out and sent another team to go send the right drugs, and they're just going to scuttle this ship and destroy the drugs, and uh, you know they're not going to brook this kind of shenanigans, and uh, so they anyway they set them loose. And we come back and finally, you know, they've been bickering throughout. Who's going to be the Red Queen? Who's going to be the Red Queen? Well, guys, this was spoiled months ago. And let's look at the cover where she's pushing forward this red chess piece. And let's try to figure out who the Red Queen's going to be. Right? And they're arguing and arguing. Oh, and we get a nice interlude. Apparently, they love drinking. Kitty Pride is a real drunk. That's like her defining characteristic so far in this book, which I do not like. Um, I don't care if you want to drink, drink away, but like it's just not funny or interesting and it's not what a leader should be doing or would be doing or would be, you know, capable of leading. Anyway, um, so they all decide to hang out in a tattoo parlor for some reason, but the tattoo guys say, hey, this is not a library, so you got to get tattoos. So they all get tattoos. Bishop, but well, they don't all get tattoos. Iceman's like, ah, you'd see it through the ice. And Bishop's like, I already have one. Storm's like, no way. But he, Pyro's ready to go and is going full face skull tattoo. So will we see the end of this Pyro or are we going to have tattoo face Pyro forever? I don't know. Anyway, then they decide to pay this guy a bunch of money and say, look, I might need some help later. So I'm just going to give you money. Foreshadowing. Come back. Oh, we got Gateway, our old buddy, the mutant um, uh, uh, aborigine teleporter guy. Since, you know, these, since Kitty Pride can't use the Krakoan gateways, she needs other ways of getting around. And we get to see Pyro's stupid face tattoo. Um, and we get to see the new Marauder's boat, yacht slash gunboat, right? And they're all excited about it. So much that Bishop's like, ooh, maybe I should stay here. It's pretty nice. Um, and uh, and finally, we get the long, just tortured reveal of, oh, I want the right, who's the Red Queen going to be? Who is it? Oh, I already did it. Finally revealed, of course, that it's Kitty Pride. We all knew this. There's no drama there, really. Um, so there you go. Oh, the one other thing I want to mention. They do finally make note of when they, when they, 
come to see before they go to the tattoo parlor. I forgot to mention this. Bishop breaks the news that uh, Xavier's been assassinated. And they're like, huh, everyone's shocked. He says, believe in the five. They can bring him back. You don't know that. Goddess. And that's when they decide to go drinking and get tattoos. Uh, okay. So that's the only connection to really the X-Men. So we know that Xavier's dead. Will he be, can he be reincarnated? It is in doubt somewhat. That's the only thing you get out of here for the main storyline. So like I said, you could skip it. And if I don't really enjoy this book, I'm, I'm going to fall off. You know, there's no way I'm not reading all of these X books unless I really enjoy them. So uh, we get a, a, a look at the org chart of the Hellfire Club. And apparently on top of all these people, there's a Lord Imperial who has not been named yet. We've got the White Queen, the Black King, and now the Red Queen, Captain Kate Pride. And they each have acolytes. I didn't know there was a Christian Frost. I'm not sure who that is. None of these other bishops have been named or knights have been named. I'm sure we'll see that uh, coming soon. In fact, next issue it says, Enter the Black Bishop, which I guess would be this character. And uh, coming next, Queen. Uh, Freddie Mercury appearance? No. Uh we're back to uh, Dawn of X, right? So Excalibur, Marauders, enjoyable, moving forward. Nothing special, though. Like, not not engaging me the way the main X books book has been engaging me. And this whole Dawn of X thing is it's still starting. It's starting slow. Um, but uh, you know what? I'm on board. And uh, speaking of being on board, man, we've welcomed more and more and more of you on board uh, this channel. If you haven't already, please take a moment, hit that subscribe button, uh, hit the bell if you want notifications when I drop new videos. I try to do, you know, two, three, sometimes four videos a week, depending on what comics come out or as the mood strikes me. So anyway, uh, oh, and also don't forget to make sure to add some comments in the comment section below. I read every single comment and I want to hear from you. So thanks for watching. Thanks for coming, talking about comics. We'll see you next time.